income tax 2023-2024. Who qualifies as your dependent definitions and special rules? Get ready and some coffee because we're setting our refund to the max with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in the line instructions section of the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at dependents, remembering that every time we look at a particular item for income taxes, we want to visualize the income tax formula and think about the primary line items that would be affected from it, and then think about the residual effects of the changes to those line items on the income tax formula. When we're thinking about dependents, the primary line items are generally the credits down below. So if we have a single taxpayer who has a dependent, then they might get a child tax credit, which could have a refundable portion to it possibly, or other dependent credits. However, there also could be changes to filing status. For example, going from single to head of household could be largely dependent on a dependent and that could affect the standard deduction as well as the tax rates. Now, we talked about dependents in a prior presentation. Usually, like with the filing statuses, it's pretty straightforward to determine if someone is a dependent or not. But sometimes we have that gray area. We talked about the general questionnaire last time. Now we'll talk about some of those gray areas that uh, we can expand upon. And those are things that you can do further research if you find uh, a question as to whether someone qualifies as a dependent or as a qualifying child versus a, a dependent. So remember the general process would be, do they qualify as a qualifying child? Because if they do, then you're looking to see if you can get the child tax credit, which would be a higher benefit than not uh, having a child tax credit. If they don't qualify for the child tax credit, then you're seeing if you can get the other dependent credit. On the form 1040, we can see that the dependents are listed down here, name, social security number, relationship, and then checking the benefit that we're gonna get, which will be shown on page two of the form 1040, either the child tax credit typically, or the credit for other dependents. And then on page two, we've got the uh, tax calculation, which could be impacted, the child tax credit uh, up top, and then you could have a refundable portion of it down below as well. Okay, again, these are some of the additional factors. So if you wanna take a look at the general thought process for whether or not someone qualifies as a dependent, look at the prior presentation. Now we're expanding on some of the definitions that you might need to drill down on in special situation. All right, so an adopted child. As we saw before with the filing statuses, an adopted child is always treated as your own child. An adopted child includes a child lawfully placed with you for legal adoption. Adoption uh, taxpayer identification number, otherwise known as the ATINs. So if they're adopted, we know that, of course, you need the number, social security number, or at least some kind of identification number. If they're adopted, that means you might have an adoption taxpayer identification, an ATIN, A-T-I-N. So if you have a dependent who was placed with you for legal adoption and you don't know the dependent's SSN, you don't have their social security number, you must get an A-10 for the dependent from the IRS. You can see form W-7A for details. If the dependent isn't a U.S. citizen or resident alien, apply for an I-10 instead using form W-7 children of divorced or separated parents. Now here's where the messiness often comes in because 
the child the child the children often have a significant impact as we can see on the tax return so who can claim the children for taxes can become a point of contention which is something that would be best to set up as soon as possible instead of kind of fighting over it at the point of time when you're actually filing the tax returns which could be a messy situation so a child will be treated as the qualifying child or qualifying relative of the child's non-custodial parent defined later if all of the following conditions apply so number one the parents are divorced legally separated uh, separated under a written separation agreement or lived apart at all times during the last six months of 2023 whether or not they were married number two the taxpayer received over half of the child's support for 2023 from the parents and the rules of rules on multi-support agreements later don't apply support of a child received from a parent's spouse is treated as provided by the parent three the child is in custody of one or both of the parents for more than half of 2023 number four either of the following applies a the custodial parent signs form 8332 or a substantially similar statement that they won't claim the child as a dependent for 2023 and the non-custodial parent includes a copy of the form or statement with their return if the divorce agree the divorce decree or separation agreement went into effect after 1984 and before 2009 the non-custodial parent may be able to include certain pages from the decree or agreement instead of form 8332 you can see publication 1984 and pre-2009 decree or agreement and post 2008 for more details there and then b a pre-1985 decree of divorce or separate maintenance or written separation agreement between the parents provides that the non-custodial parent can claim the child as a dependent and the non-custodial parent provides uh, at least six hundred dollars for support okay so how when would this possibly take place now note that you, if you're looking at who is going to basically get the benefit of the child on the tax return it's usually going to be the custodial parent meaning the parent that the child is living with however you can imagine situations where the parent who this child is living with might not get the biggest tax benefit from them living there because possibly they're already head of household for example and maybe they don't have a lot of income and maybe it's not going to have an impact on their earned in credit or child tax credit uh, therefore because you're only getting the refundable portions of them or something like that and in that case you can kind of imagine that the non-custodial parent might have a bigger overall tax benefit if they were able to basically claim the dependent so you might have a situation where you would like the non-custodial parent to basically be uh, claiming the dependent so these are types of things that would be best worked out in a divorce or separation or custody kind of agreement taking into consideration these somewhat complex tax consequences so that they can be worked out you know not again before actually filing the tax returns right so so if that applies you could drill down deeper into into that if you're looking at someone who's in a divorce situation as a taxpayer you know the question is how much detail do you want to get in on a divorce uh situ situation you can basically go over the tax law and then of course the lawyers are going to be the ones that are going to be uh, hashing out any kind of divorce agreement who have hopefully will take into consideration tax situations okay so if conditions one through four apply only the non-custodial parent can claim the child for purposes of the child tax credits and for credit for other dependents line 19 and 28 however this doesn't allow the non-custodial parent to claim head of household filing status so here we've got a separation between these two conditions as to whether they're going to qualify for head of household or not which i mentioned a second ago which could be something that is largely dependent upon dependence but in a situation where the non-custodial parent uh is is basically claiming the child possibly they can get access to the child tax credit but might not be able to consider that child in terms of support for the head of household so again kind of a sticky or kind of a confusing uh, situation which could often happen in these kind of weird uh, situations where you have this custody claims for the dependents 
So the credit for child and dependent care expenses, the exclusion or dependent care benefits, or the earned, uh, earned income credit. So all of these often have impacts from whether or not you have a dependent. And again, if you're in this kind of weird situation where you're the non-custodial parent, you might not get the same benefit as you were if you were the custodial parent with a dependent on the form. So once again, however, this doesn't allow the non-custodial parent to claim head of household filing status, which would the, the credit for child and dependent care expenses, not the child tax credit. This is a different credit. The exclusion for dependent care expense uh, benefits or the earned income tax credit, which is another huge refundable credit, which depends largely on the number of dependents which we'll talk about later. So the custodial parent or another taxpayer, if eligible, can claim the child for the earned income uh, credit. So that's an interesting situation because again, you can imagine the one that's taking care of, of the child, uh, if they would still possibly want the child to be claimed for the earned income credit, because even if they don't have any income, that could be a significant benefit to them because they won't be paying tax but could participate in kind of the welfare uh, type of, of benefit program can claim the child for the earned income credit and these other benefits so again if this is a situation you're, you're in you can take a look at publication 501 to drill down on more detail to make sure to get that straightened out it's custodial and non-custodial parents so what does that mean the custodial parent is the parent with whom the child lived for the greater number of nights in 2023. So if there is a dispute about a child as to which tax return they can be on, usually the breaking factor would be who, who did the child live longer with because the assumption would be that they're the ones that are taking care of the child. But now we're looking at this situation where you have the non-custodial parent, right? So the custodial parent being the one that they lived with most of the time, right? So the custodial parent is the parent with whom the child lived for the greater number of nights. The non-custodial parent is the other parent. Now, obviously, again, this gets kind of ugly because if it's a split down the middle, you would think it would be even. That's how a lot of you know divorce systems might work. And then if you were to try to prove the number of nights, you might actually track the number of nights and whatnot and try to say that and document it and all that kind of stuff. So if the child was with each parent for an equal number of nights, the custodial parent is the parent with the higher adjusted gross income. Now, some people see that as not fair. Why would you give the child benefit at the tiebreaker to the one with the higher income? Well, probably because that's the one that's gonna be providing more of the financial benefits. So, and possibly it's the one that maybe is gonna have a higher tax benefit from it. Although with the refundable credits, that may not always be the case, right? So you can see publication 501 for the exception for a parent who works at night, rules for a child who is uh, emancipated under state law and other details. Okay, post 1984 and pre 2009 decree or agreement. The decree or agreement must state all three of the following. The non-custodial parent can claim the child as a dependent without regard to any condition such as payment of support. So we have these condition, like is the thing conditional on support payments, which you would think would be like alimony or something like that. The other parent won't claim the child as a dependent. So obviously in these agreements, the whole point is that you've worked out who's gonna get the tax benefit from the child to best benefit everybody involved so that uh, not both parents will, will be reporting the same child on the tax return, which will of course cause problems into the future because the IRS will see two social security numbers and they'll then they'll, they'll be a blowback on that like for sure. So the years for which the claim is, is released. Okay, the non-custodial parent must include all of the following pages from the decree or agreement. So the cover page, include the other parent's social security number on that page, the pages that include all the information identified in one through four above, signature page with the other parent's signature and date of agreement, post 2008 decree or agreement. So now we're after laws change and as the law changes, then sometimes they're gonna of course be able to say, well, whatever it was prior to that law change, we're gonna try to keep it the same 
because you've, you've already made contractual agreements based on tax law prior to that point. This is what's difficult with tax law because oftentimes you can't change it retroactively. You have to change it from one point going forward. So now we're talking post 2008 uh, decree or agreement. So if the divorce decree or separation agreement went into effect after 2008, the non-custodial parent can't include pages from the decree or agreement instead of form 8332. So they have to have a form 8332 generally. So the custodial parent must sign either form 8332 or substantially similar statement, the only purpose of which is to release the custodial parent's claim to certain tax benefits for a child and to non-custodial parent must include a copy with their return. The form or statement must release the custodial parent's claim to the child without any conditions. For example, the release must not depend on the non-custodial parent paying support. So release of certain tax benefits revoked. A custodial parent who has revoked their previous release of a claim to certain tax benefits for the child must include a copy of the revocation with their return. So now they got the, something got mad. They got a new lawyer and the new lawyer said, what are you doing for crying out loud? <laughs> and we got, and so then they revoked it. So for details, you can see form 8332 for that one. So exception uh, uh, to citizen tests. So now we saw that there was a citizen test. Uh, and again, that's another area where you could find uh, gray points that you do further research on. So if you are a U.S. citizen, a U.S. national, and your adopted child lived with you all year as a member of your household, that child meets the requirement to be a U.S. citizen in step two, question one, step three, question two, step four, question two, and step five question two, which are all basically the same questions in our questionnaire that we talked about in a prior presentation. So exception to gross income test. So if your relative, including person who lived with you all year as a member of your household is permanently and totally disabled to find later certain income for service performed at a sheltered uh, workshop may be excluded for this test. So again, we saw that there was uh, a gross income test to some of the question points to see whether they qualify as a dependent. So you could have an exception to some of those items in certain situations. Exception to time lived with you. So we saw that, we, we, for example, they had to live with you for half the year and whatnot. And again, you can imagine scenarios where they didn't live with you for half the year for weird things where they would have lived with you for half the year. And does that count to be allowed to have them as a dependent. Okay, let's check it out. Temporary absences by you or the other person for special circumstances such as school, vacation. So they were at school, they went on vacation, but they still would have lived with me if they if I didn't send them off to vacation. <laughs> it's a mandatory vacation. Get that kid on vacation. Business, uh, medical care. So they were in the hospital. They would have been home, but they were gone for medical care. Military service or detention in a juvenile facility. They were in juvie. What do you want me to do? <laughs> they, were, they would have been home, but they were in juvie. Okay, so they all count as time the person lived with you. So also see children of divorced or separated parents earlier or kidnapped child later. So if the person meets all other requirements to be your qualified child, but was born or died in 2023, the person is considered to have lived with you for more than half of two. So now you have a situation, they, you have the child, they lived with you, but you're saying more than half the year, but the child died in 2023. Well, well, that's going to make it harder for them to say they lived with you for more than half the year. Do you have to carry like the ashes in your living room uh, until you put, for, you know, for like part of the year? Well, no. So that circumstance, what do we have to do? Well, so if the person meets all the requirements to your qualifying child, but was born or died in 2023, the person is considered to have lived with you for more than half of 2023. If your home was this person's home for more than half the time the person was alive which makes sense, right? So now they were alive half the year. And so they lived with you more than half the time of the time they were alive. Okay, so if the person meets all the other requirements to be your qualified child, 
but you adopted the person in 2023. The person was lawfully placed with you for legal adoption by you in 2023, or the person was an eligible foster child placed with you during 2023. The person is considered to have lived with you for more than half of 2023 if your main home was this person's main home for more than half the time since the person was adopted or placed with you in 2023. Any other person is considered to have lived with you for all of 2023 if the person was born or died in 2023 and your home was this person's home for the entire time the person was alive in 2023 or if you adopted the person in 2023, the person was lawfully placed with you for legal adoption by you in 2023, or the person was an eligible foster child placed with you during 2023, and your main home was the person's main home for the entire time since the person was adopted or placed with you in 2023. Okay, foster child. So a foster child is any child placed with you by an authorized placement agency or a judgment decree or other order of any court of competent jurisdiction. So they have the right to be able to do that. So kidnapped child. So if your child is presumed by law enforcement authorities to have been kidnapped by someone who isn't a family member, you may be able to take the child into account in determining your eligibility for head of household or qualifying surviving spouse filing status. Now, hopefully th this would be a tragic situation, but from a tax perspective, the kid was kidnapped. So then again, the, the, you could have significant impacts if you were to claim the child or not, which could include moving from single status to head of household. So what do you do about that? And, and so on. So child into account and determine your eligibility for head of household or qualifying survivor spouse filing status, the child tax credit. Again, a bit, that's the other big one. The credit for other dependents, if they didn't qualify for the child tax credit. The earned income tax credit could have a big significance if you have a child for that one. Uh, for details, you could see publication 501, publication 596 for the earned income tax credit. So married person, if the person is married and files a joint return, you can't claim that person as your dependent. Why? Because they're married. If they're married, you would think they're on their own at that point in time. However, there might be exceptions to that situation. So however, if the person is married but doesn't file a joint return or files a joint return only to claim a refund of withheld income tax or estimated tax paid, you may be able to claim that person as a dependent. So they're married, but if they weren't married, you would generally be able to claim them as a dependent. They're still, in essence, dependent upon you is the scenario, but they and they wouldn't even have filed a return, but they did a little bit of work last year and they got W-2 income. The employer withheld income from the W-2 income and the only way for them to get that money back was to file a return. And that's the only reason they filed then maybe you still could claim them as a dependent, even though they're married and file a married filing joint return. So unusual situation. But if that applies, you could see publication 501 for details and examples. In that case, go to step two, question three for qualifying child or step four, question four for qualifying relative. All right, multiple support agreements. So if no one person contributed to over half the support of your relative, so now you've got this kid, there's usually a support test where one person has to give more than half the support for the kid to qualify, but now you've got multiple people that are supporting this kid, and that means that none of them are, are meeting the support test because instead of having just like one person supporting them or one tax entity, you've got multiple tax entities, none of which provide more than half the support. Well, you can't just lose the benefits from the credit from the kid. What good is the kid? if no one gets any tax benefit from them, someone's got to get it in that situation. So what do you do? So, so if no one person contributed over half of the support of your relative or a person who lived with you all year as a member of your household, but you and another person's provided more than half of your relative's support, special rules may apply that would treat you as having provided over half of the support. Okay. Someone's got to be able to claim this person, right? For details on that, you can see publication 501. Permanently and totally disabled. A person who is permanently and totally disabled 
if at any time during 2023 that person can't engage in any substantial gainful activity, meaning they can't work generally, because of physical or mental condition, and a doctor has determined that this condition has lasted or can be expected to last continuously for at least a year uh, or can be expected to lead to death. That's what permanently and totally disabled. What is, so we saw that that condition was, for example, in one of the age tests for a qualifying child. So again, you have to get into the details. What exactly does that mean, right? Because so public assistance payments. If you receive payments under the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, the TANF program or other public assistance program, uh, you used the money to support another person. In that case, you could see publication 501. All right. Qualifying child of more than one person. So now you've got this child where usually you go through that questionnaire, only one person would qualify, but now you've got a child that could potentially qualify for more than one person. You can't put the same child on multiple returns. Only one person gets the tax benefit of that kid. So we got to say, uh, who's going to who's gonna get it? So even if a child meets the conditions to be the qualifying child of more than one person, only one person can claim the child as a qualifying child for all the following tax benefits, unless the special rule for children of divorced or separated parents described earlier applies. So you've got the child tax credit and credit for other dependents, line 19, and the additional child tax credit. You can't have two people claiming those credits for one social security number for one kid, right? That kid, you know, the, the kid only has so many virtues, right? Which are tax benefit virtues. So you can't like, so head of household, you can't have two people go and say from single to head of household, changing their and upgrading their filing status based on a dependent, which is the same dependent. Credit for child and dependent care expenses. So we haven't talked about that credit yet, but if you have child and dependent care, you can't have those on two tax returns. And so exclus exclusion for dependent care benefits, that's form 2441 part three and the earned income credit, which we'll talk about later, largely dependent upon the number of dependents. You can't be claiming multiple dependents to get this refundable credit, which is quite substantial that's based largely on the number of dependents. You can't have that same dependence on multiple returns or things would get crazy. So no other person can take any of the five tax benefits just listed based on the, fall, uh, on the qualifying child. So if no other person can take any of the five tax benefits just listed on the qualifying child, if you and any other person claim the child as a qualifying child, the following rules apply. For purposes of these rules, the term, quote, parent, end quote, means a biological or adoptive parent of an individual. It doesn't include a step parent or foster parent unless that person has adopted the individual. So if only one of the persons uh, is the child's parent, the child is treated as the qualifying child of the parent. That would seem somewhat uh, logical in that case. So, so if the parents, uh, parents file a joint return together and can claim the child as a qualifying child, the child is treated as the qualifying child of the parents. So obviously if the parents are married, then they would be on the filing joint return. You would think if the parents don't file a joint return together, but both parents claim the child as a qualifying child, the IRS will cheat the child as the qualifying child of the parent with whom the child lived for the longer period of time. So that's the tie-breaking factor if you find yourself in this situation, typically. Two people saying this child qualifies for them. You've got joint custody situation. Both of them are wanting to claim the taxes. If you both put the social security number on your returns, the IRS will most likely question those returns. And then you're going to have to log in the number of days and say, this kid lived with me longer than that deadbeat over there. And, and, then, you can, and then you could go from... And then you could go from there and try to figure it out again. But, but again, it would be nice to have that figured out before that point in time. Also realize that if you file a tax return, whoever files first, the tax return might go through more likely because the social security number has not yet been recognized. The second person to try to claim the child might get a kickback of the return from the e-filing status, the IRS claiming that it's already been claimed, in which case, you might say, well, yeah, but they claimed it incorrectly. 
So you might then try to try to paper file the return so that you make your claim legitimately, which could delay the refund and again get you into this kind of uh, this kind of battle, which again could delay refunds and usually benefits lawyers. So if the child lived with each parent for the same amount of time, the IRS will treat the child as the qualified child of the parent who had the higher adjusted gross income, AGI, everything else equal. The AGI for the higher person is the tiebreaker. Why? Because that's probably the person who is providing the support for the child in terms of financial support, at least. So if no parent can claim the child as a qualified child, the child is treated as the qualified child of the person who had the highest AGI, adjusted gross income, for 2023. Same rationale. If a parent can claim the child as a qualifying child, but no parent does so, uh, does so claim the child, the child is treated as the qualifying child of the person who had the highest AGI for 2023, but only if that parent's AGI is higher than the highest AGI of any parent of the child who can claim the child. All right, example, this would be helpful. Your child, Jay, meets the conditions to be a qualifying child for both you and your parent. Jay doesn't meet the conditions to be a qualifying child of any other person, including Jane's, Jay's other parent. So under the rules just described, you can claim Jay as a qualifying child for all of the five tax benefits just listed for which you otherwise qualify. For par uh, Your parents can't claim any of those five tax benefits based on Jay. However, if your parents' AGI is higher than yours uh, and you do not claim Jay as a qualifying child, Jay is the qualifying child of your parent. Okay, so let me see if I can break this down a bit. We've got Jay here is the child it's between you the parent and your parents right and the other spouse we're saying is out of the picture because the kid jay doesn't qualify for for the other parents so it's between you and your parents now obviously if you want to claim the child then you would think that it would go to you because you're the parent however you can imagine a situation where maybe you it would be more beneficial that that your parents would claim the child since he also qualifies under them as well. So if you don't claim the child as a dependent, that would mean no one has claimed the child as a dependent. And your parents then, since they still qualify and you didn't take the qualification as the first one to be able to, possibly they can take the child as a dependent. As you can imagine from tax planning standpoint, there could be scenarios where that might be the most beneficial thing to happen, right? So for more details on, on something like that, uh, you can look uh, in examples. You can see publication 501 if you have those kind of complex examples and you want to do some possible, maybe there's some ability for some tax planning uh, in there as well. So, okay.